Hi, Ross Pluskin here. I'm back at the TSA retail facility. And today we're gonna to be continuing our running series, What is a Fish? A series where we take a literal ocean of fish diversity and we chop up all these various animals that we collectively describe as fish and we really start to spotlight them at a family level. So today, I'm very excited, we'll be discussing a fish family that is very, very unique uh, has some interesting nuances and challenges when it comes to keeping it in captivity and breeding it, but also has a lot of uh, long running success stories at this point. This family, without further ado, is the Signathidae. This is the family of the seahorses, the pipefish, and the sea dragons. So, the wonderful example right behind me here, we have Hippocampus erectus, the northern line seahorse. So wonderful wonderful species which is native up and down the Atlantic coast here. You can find these wonderful critters dwelling in the eelgrass beds and amongst the clams and the salt ponds where I'm from in Rhode Island and Connecticut all the way down south here in Florida where they hang out in turtle grass beds and among seagrass beds and all kinds of other habitats. So let's talk about the Signathidae as a whole and then we'll go back to this wonderful specimen that we see behind me. So the Signathidae as a whole are relatively derived fish. That means that they're relatively far along in the evolutionary ch chain. Whereas something like a shark is a really well-oiled, well-modeled uh, Model T, uh, a Toyota engine that's been tested and trusted and, and stays constant over time, the seahorse is more like a updated Tesla, where it's basically the last of nature's evolutionary takes on fish, at least in the shallow water environments that we've observed. We can see this based on how much modification and specialization exists in every single little fin of the seahorse. Whereas we've gone from the classic teleost, uh, conventional fish shape, and we've really done something dramatically different here, where our dorsal fin, our pectoral fins, all these are no longer designed to travel long horizontal distances or even long vertical distances, but rather the entire anatomy of the Signathids is designed to live in a moderate to low flow environment, rich in structure to navigate that environment and then use its specialized eyes and feeding parts to locate and constantly be boom, 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 attacking all manner of small microfauna that exists amongst the eelgrass, mangrove roots, rocks, and, and clam beds of its native environment. Uh, so the Signathidae, let's take a look at this wonderful specimen you see behind me. What's it doing? It's constantly navigating its environment, using its fins not so much to purposefully go in big, long general directions, but to maneuver slightly in kind of overlapping ellipses where it's constantly observing the area around it. It's observing the pipe. It would be observing uh, all kinds of uh, corals, rock work, eelgrass in the wild, structure, macroalgae, and it'd be constantly using its eyes like an aquatic chameleon to locate copepods, tiny krill, possum shrimp, isopods, tiny worms, all manners of microforage that this wonderful set of fish are designed to specialize in prey on. So let's do a quick comparison with some other fish families that we visited in the past, such as the Serenity, the Groupers and the Sea Bass, and the Acanthuridae, the Tangs. So the big contrast we always talk about with these two groups is that one has a very small stomach like the Tangs and a very long intestine for processing a bunch of forage that's not like fish tissue, algae and other things. And then the groupers, the ceranids, have a very large stomach and a relatively short intestine, taking big meals, not constantly grazing, cooking that meal down and, and converting it into very similar tissue. The signathids dwell in this weird middle ground where they're much more similar to Antheus and the Calliomydidae, the mandarin dragonettes that we've discussed in other past episodes as well where they, yes, they have a small cardiac stomach, but they are true carnivores. You won't catch seahorses grazing on fields of macroalgae in the wild. Rather, they mingle, they dwell, they hunt amongst the macroalgae for all the small but still meaty prey items that they take in, cook down relatively quickly in that smaller stomach, and then they have a relatively longer intestine, not as long as a tang, but certainly longer than a, a large goliath grouper, and they use that uh, to constantly process 
that continuous forge that they're receiving. Now, we can see here an immediate pitfall that arises when trying to keep members of the Signathidae in captivity. Unlike a chalk basslet, we can't just give this a frozen cube of mysis once a day or once a week and call it and, and assume that the animal will be fine. Because of their really fast metabolism and relatively long intestine, members of the Signathidae are like mandarin dragonettes, where they are constantly depending on live food forage that's present in their environment, and they also require relatively frequent direct feedings of larger prey items such as frozen mysis and potentially even pellets as well. By marrying continuous feeding and having purposeful direct feeding frequent, frequently as well is the best way to accommodate to the, the needs of this very high metabolism set of fish, with only some of the larger specimens being things such as the weedy sea dragon, which is incredibly difficult to keep because of its relatively large size coupled with that rapid, fast, rapid pace metabolism. So, a few things when trying to keep Signathidae in aquariums. You have to cater to these various biological unique faculties that they have. Firstly, is the fact that they cannot maneuver very confidently in strong flow environments. In Achilles Tang, this is not. That being said, they still require relatively good water quality. So, we're trying to achieve more of a nuanced goal here when it comes to the flow dynamics of this fish where we're looking for relatively high overturn where we have lots of interaction with the display tanks water interacting with the filtration that's polishing it but we want low actual directional flow we don't want constant heavy flow hammering on these seahorses because they simply don't have the muscles and the fins to navigate that confidently um for this reason most seahorses, because they're relatively delicate and cannot handle higher levels of flow, are often best accommodated in smaller aquariums that are designed to be more macroalgae based rather than being a strict open water reef. This is where seahorses really start to entertain their own genre of marine aquarium keeping. You'll find that rather than trying to shove them into a conventional reef tank, um, it's much more common that people have success making a seahorse only aquarium or rather an aquarium pretty much designed towards catering to the seahorses. They need better water quality because they can succumb to a wide variety of skin and intestinal diseases. And this is also something which has encouraged, especially in the last couple decades, more and more captive bred and sustainable aquaculture of members of this family. The individual you see behind me in particular is an aquaculture specimen. Something that's also very unique about the Signathidae that's very advantageous towards this end is that unlike a tang or a grouper, they have no very small, fragile, pelagic larval state. Male and female seahorses will mate, and then the males actually have a specialized pouch which allows them to gestate and develop the young through their embryonic development and allows the male to once again, very rare amongst marine fish, be a good dad and release fully competent metamorphosed juvenile seahorses into um, the water column. So as a whole, the Signathidae, we have the seahorses, we have the pipefish, and we have the weedy sea dragons, all of which are enchanting and unique members of this fish family. Um, and many, if not all of which, have their own nuances and difficulties when it comes to feeding because of how rapidly they require live foods and other sor sorts of forage, but also a very encouraging family because more and more and more and more species of this family are being sustainably aquacultured, not only in the laboratory and experimental purposes, but commercially at a large scale to the point where there will soon be a time where vastly more seahorses are aquacultured uh, purchase than those that are wild caught. Um, I'd like to leave this episode on a question. Do you have a seahorse tank? What is your setup? Did you have a lot of success or is there something you'd like to modify if you're going to try it again? What kinds of foods did you feed your seahorse? Please comment below. So please like, subscribe, feed the algorithm like a hungry line seahorse slurping down a bunch of mice and shrimp and we will see you next time.